Welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and I'm joined this week by my colleague, Jay Shabat, as to discuss the operational situation in London this fall and American Airlines' regional connectivity strategy. Thank you and enjoy. Hey, Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Ned. How are you? Uh, doing well, doing well. Out in Colorado this week, got a, a chance to, to fly domestically again, and, and things were going smoothly for the most part on my part. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good week. Good to hear. Good to hear that things went smoothly. That's uh, not the case for everybody these days, as, as we know. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, the other day I saw New York had some bad weather and, and some airlines were even turning transcontinental flights around about mid-country and going back to the West Coast because uh, things were so bad. So I'm glad I missed that. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's uh, don't want to be on that, that flight. <laughs> anyway, we're actually going to talk about uh, things getting better operationally in most places, specifically London. Yeah, so... Uh, London uh, is is has shown some improvements. Um, it was uh, <laughs> at least as messy as some of the things we were just describing in the U.S. here uh, over the summer. Uh, but uh, some of the airports over there imposed a uh, certain artificial capacity cap. Right. So this was a cap on the number of passengers that could come through Gatwick, Heathrow, uh, air other airports on the continent did the same, uh, which basically forced airlines to to pull schedules. One of the you know. British Airways, having the largest operation in London, was one of the most impacted. You know, they cut their summer schedule by, I want to say, up to twelve percent from plan, uh, and plan being sort of at the beginning of the year. So it was you know, there were some pretty tough uh, caps on airlines. Yeah, that's 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 rough, especially the ones that hit during the peak summer season, because for a lot of these airlines, particularly in Europe. Summer is make or break. Um, I was I was just looking even at, at Ryanair's numbers and uh, financials in 2019, and even they lost quite a bit of money in the winter. And uh, ultimately, what made them profitable for the full year is just those you know kind of plump summertime profits. So uh, if you hear an airport start saying, "Well, you can't you know, can't can't fly what you want, even though you've got the demand." During your, you know, the, the one or two months of the year when you make all your money, that becomes, uh, yeah, very, very difficult to swallow. Especially, and we keep writing about and talking about, you know, how airlines are underutilizing their assets. So, you know, Ryanair has all of its aircraft and services, nothing parked. So, if they're not able to use all those aircraft as planned during the summer, that's underutilization, and, and losses can easily come from that. So, but. <laughs> We're not here to talk about those. Things are getting better for Ryanair because Gatwick uh, announced this week that they will be ending their caps at the end of August after hiring uh, over 400 new security staff. So Gatwick is is getting back to normal. Yeah, so Gatwick uh, does seem to be getting getting better, and they were able to, uh, as, as I think you mentioned, they, they're going to end their capacity caps. Um, Heathrow, however, is a different story. They said that they were going to keep their caps on through the end of October, which is sort of the end of the uh, traditional, uh, what do they call it, the IATA summer season. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's that's somewhat of a frustration. I, I believe Amsterdam was the one other big airport that's that's also extended their um, their caps through the fall. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they, you know, even though demand tends to drop off a bit, I guess, you know, they just haven't, they still have some staffing issues at the airport and they still, I guess, want to be better safe than sorry. That's right. It's, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it surprises me because I expected as schedules came down that these caps would ease across the board. But right, like you said, safe than sorry. And speaking of Heathrow, British Airways being the largest airline there, they have gone one step further and pulled their winter Heathrow capacity down by 8%. From plan, now you know they the according to the airline, this was this winter schedule that they published at the end of 2021, and we all know that those year out schedules are more a, a matter of fiction than reality. But eight percent is still a significant reduction. Right, right, and it's uh, you know an important point you make that sometimes uh, yeah the schedules that are far, especially nowadays, everything's so volatile with schedules that uh, you know if you look a couple months into ahead, it's the schedules are not too meaningful. It's it's, it's pretty routine that uh, there'll be something that you might find out two or three months from now that's bookable, but may actually not fly because uh, you know it's just sort of a template schedule that they'll readjust. So that that all being said. 
um, to take out that many seats is, um, you know, pretty big admission that, uh, you know, we're either not going to have the demand or probably more like in this case, you know, we're not going to have the either staffing or the airport's not going to have the staffing or the airport's not going to let us because of the capacity constraints. So, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's very meaningful now in typical fashion, uh, Ryanair seized advantage of, uh, of the, uh, the situation here and, uh, put out a statement uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, where they're actually going to add uh, more than a million seats to its UK winter schedule. Now, Ryanair is not, they don't even fly from Heathrow. They're, um, they're mostly a, a London Stansted airport. They do fly from uh, London Luton as well. And they do a little bit of Gatwick, a few routes from Gatwick. To, uh, so, um, but they, uh, they issued a statement that, uh, you know, you can hear, hear this coming from, um, in Michael O'Leary's voice, but, uh, you know, we're going to, this is in response to BA's announcement that it will cancel 8% of its winter schedule due to staff shortages and capacity cuts at hopeless Heathrow. Quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got to love Michael yeah. O'Leary's. Uh, he loves to give you know, nicknames to pretty much everything. Um, you know, yes, what is the yes. game changer for the, for the 787 Max that, you know, Madhu, our, our former colleague, used to always say, you know, Michael O'Leary, you can't make fetch happen. Uh, he would appreciate that <laughs> reference. But you know, it's interesting. Ryan, uh, Ryanair is just always, you know, they are always game to, you know, pick up when a competitor is down. So, but I'm curious because Stansta didn't have caps. So it's interesting to me that they're, you know, how they're adding seats or, you know, it's very possible that these seat additions were coming anyway. And now they can just sort of market them as a response to BA's cuts. So very interesting yeah, that, to play there. <laughs> No, no, it is. And, and they didn't specify that it was from Stansted or even from London. Uh, they said the UK. So I was uh, started, look, you know, just kind of poking around schedules in uh, um, DO by Sirium database. And they, you know, it shows uh, certainly some some new new stuff from, from London, but uh, but other airports as well in the UK, like Manchester and Birmingham, et cetera. Right. I mean, and frankly, with Gatwick removing its caps, EasyJet and Wizz Air are the most likely beneficiaries because they are well easy just the largest airline at Gatwick I believe BA is still number two and then the Wizz Air is is up there so but we haven't heard anything from EasyJet or Wiz about plans at Gatwick I, I queried EasyJet but they never got back to me so I'm, I'm curious to see if they'll be adding you know those discounters will be adding flights there this winter yeah something to watch and always keep in mind I'm not sure that everyone realizes this but London is the largest airline market in the world, or at least was before, before the pandemic. And that's counting all the area airports. So if you, you know, you get, you put the, your Heathrow and your Gatwick and your Stansted and your Luton and your South End and whatever I'm missing together, uh, city airport, um, that something, I mean, I don't know, I don't know the number, but I believe well in excess of 150 million passengers a year. So Atlanta is the busiest single airport. Uh, right in the world. But if you, if you just look at, you know, city markets, um, London, number one, New York, number two. So this is, uh, you know, the stakes are very high here when Heathrow says they're, you know, gonna not allow you to fly. I was looking at some, um, numbers just, just for Heathrow. I might as well mention them here. Uh, there, the, the capacity caps that, uh, we were referring to earlier, um, they're, Heathrow is not going to, uh, you're not allowed to, or they're not going to handle more than 100,000 departing passengers per day. So that's the sort of the numeric cap. And from best I can see, uh, in July of 2019, so peak season before the pandemic, uh, they were handling an average of about 125,000. So that's, you know, it's a pretty big cut. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, BA's cut, I mean, a lot of other airlines have already pulled down, and, and you know, I reported from Farm Bureau Show where Emirates, uh, you know, Chairman or President Sir Tim Clark made some very um, pointed statements about uh, about the Heathrow caps. But you know, that's uh, in the past; they seem to have gotten past that. So, yeah, it will be interesting to see how this plays out. And and I've got to do a shout out for my home, Washington D.C. market. We might not be number one or two, but you know, with three airports, we get up to 75, we got up to 75 million passengers a year in 2019. So, you know, we're, we're up there, we're up there, but there you go. Yeah. Very big market. And then very premium market too. A lot of uh, big time corporate and government traffic in Washington. Absolutely. All right, Jay, let's take a quick break and, and we'll be right back.
and we're back. Jay, we're, we just talked about the you know situation in London as they come out of the summer with Gatwick re- removing its caps. Let's head across the Atlantic to North America, where American Airlines is making some news with uh, on its regional side. Yeah, so American, uh, uh, one of their executives presented at, a, at an investor event uh, yesterday, and uh, they um, said that they, uh, well, the big news uh, from this week is that they were uh, they have a new regional partner, which you can tell us about, Ned. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, when um, Jay says yesterday, he was referring to Tuesday, and American unveiled that they've signed Air Wisconsin, a former United, well, the current United Express operator as a new regional affiliate with up to 60 CRJ 200s coming into the American Eagle system by October 2023. Now, this is an interesting move because U.S. airlines are have been pulling down 50-seat regional jet fleets for, for years now, really uh, that predated the pandemic. United did add Air Wisconsin in 2017 when it left American. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a return for, for the airline. But yesterday at the investor conference, uh, sorry, Tuesday at the investor conference, Vasu Raja, <laughs> the chief commercial officer at American said, that they're able to add this 50 seat flying because American, and this, these are their numbers, offers 30% more con- unique connecting itineraries in the US than their nearest competitors, Delta and United. And because of that, they're able to, to um, get higher yields, i.e. charge higher fares on those routes. And so that allows them to fly more of these inefficient, more expensive 50 seat regional jets. Yes, and it's very interesting. They, they seem to be putting a lot of emphasis on this regional uh, sort of strategy of of connecting. I think I think one of the examples that Vasu used was uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, sort of a, you know not a market that's big enough to be a hub or to support a lot of mainline service. So at a time when you know regional pilots are scarce and regional aircraft are being retired, um, these kind of markets are under pressure. So American wants to be the one that can offer the best schedules uh, from these places. And they can do that in part by, uh, because of their, you know, Dallas and Charlotte in particular, just fantastic, uh, super profitable hubs for them. And they can sort of pipe in traffic from Knoxville into these hubs and onward to pretty much the rest of the world. Now, just backing up, you can sort of see American, what they're thinking here. So American has had, to be frank, an international problem. Uh, London has, you know, that's a very strong market for them. Uh, Anything in Latin America is very strong, but they've always kind of been rather weak in Asia. And then Vasu said something yesterday, uh, said something that was interesting yesterday that some of their um, trans, uh, some of their uh, transatlantic strategy that they pursued uh, in recent years where they try to kind of, fly some secondary leisure markets just during summers. Um, he basically kind of said that didn't work. And Ned, you said something to me that kind of, I think, kind of nailed it, um, that those kind of markets require sort of older depreciated aircraft, like 767s, 757s, and those are gone. I mean, are they all gone, Ned? I, I believe yeah. they are, right? America yeah, retired all, all their 57s and 67s in 2020, which... Uh, you know, in the depths of the crisis was a good strategic move. They had to, you know, cut assets and everything. But as demand has come back without those planes, you know, the you know, thinner seasonal routes across the Atlantic that, you know, the the cost of doing that just becomes much harder to achieve when you're flying new 787s. And this is completely aside from the 787 delays that American experience. But, you know, it's it's one thing to try. And Vasu actually mentioned a United example without naming United. He mentioned uh, Tenerife. You know, it's a lot easier to do Tenerife when you when you have uh, you know older aircraft that you know have very little capital costs that you have to pay than it is to do it with a brand new seven eight seven. Though I should asterisk is Tenerife's being flown with the Max, so it actually is being flown with a new aircraft. But that's another point. <laughs> Interesting. And United, uh, they still do have their 757s and 767s, right? They were a little bit more, uh, less less aggressive in dumping their older aircraft, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Uh, United and Delta both kept their 757 and 767 fleets. Um, United in its entirety, I believe Delta retired seven seven six sevens, a very small number, basically. I, let's, okay. let's not, let's yeah. not hold me to that seven number. Um, 
So, right. you know, and they've been able to use those aircrafts rapidly ramp up as as demand is returned. So American is saying, you know, we can do domestic uh, connectivity better while our competitors can maybe do international better. And that's uh, that was the case that Basu was making to investors this week. Exactly. And, and I think, yeah, that last sentence you just said sort of summed it up um, very nicely. And uh, yeah, remember, too, that, uh, you know, the American has had trouble in New York uh, internationally that kind of. Uh, I don't want to, you know, outsource is too strong a word, but in a sense, they're kind of outsourcing that stuff to JetBlue. I mean, they're doing, you know, they're they're still flying some of the stuff, but JetBlue is, you know, kind of providing the feed for them. And then, you know, sort of in the West, they've got help from Alaska. So they're really, uh, seems like they, uh, to make up their sort of operating margin deficit versus def- versus Delta and United, and, and that has been the case where they've kind of trailed them in earnings over the last few years. They seem to be really uh, sort of doubling down or focusing on this, uh, you know, getting getting yield premiums on these regional routes where, you know, some of the some of their rivals are not going to be as, you know, not offer as convenient a schedule. Right. And let's be clear, Delta and United are not pulling out of most regional markets. Right. They've pulled out of some right. small ones, but you know, they're just the the argument American has is is they're gonna provide so much more depth than Delta and United. You know, their competitors will have a couple flights a day, whereas American can get you to Charlotte or Dallas or Philadelphia or Phoenix and you know connect you onto the world or at least the rest of the US very easily. So it's it's an interesting yeah. statement. And then let's also mention the yield is important because American did have those uh, the big new pilot contracts at uh, their wholly owns PSA Piedmont and Envoy in June. So you know they need that yield premium to to you know cover those new expenses, those, those increased expenses they now have at their at their wholly owned regional airlines as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They're, uh, you know, especially on the regional side. If you're in that game right now, the co- the just the cost inflation on the regional side has been so significant that, uh, yeah, if you want to play in that game, you've got it. You know, you, you really got to get the yield premiums on that. So, uh, you know, there there have been different strategies. To, you know, United has, uh, I know, in the past uh, reconfigured some of their fifty seaters with uh, semi premium type cabin and. Um, there have been dish, different strategies to do that, um, and Americans just yeah they're they're hoping that their just schedules are simply superior from places like Knoxville. Yes, it'll it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Though I on on the regional pilot expense side, uh, Commute Air also announced a new agreement with its pilots this week that brings them not up to Americans wholly owned level, but they're going to be the fourth highest paid. So the race to increase uh, you know regional pilot pay is on, and it's going to be see how that works interesting to see how that works out in the economics of of regional airline feed in the coming years so that that's something to watch it's a good time to be a pilot yeah and hopefully it'll <laughs> encourage more people to uh to could to come into the uh profession absolutely and i think that's ultimately the goal it's just as we've talked about before it takes a while for someone to go from zero hours to being a commercial airline pilot uh, so you know, down the road, it definitely these these moves should definitely pay off, but it's not going to be an instantaneous, uh, you know, overnight kind of thing. Right, right. Well, Jay, thank you so much for joining. Um, listeners, you can reach me, Edward, at er at skiff.com. You can reach Jay at js at skiff.com. Thank you again for joining for the Airline Weekly Lounge and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.